for the mayor to sign and clerk to attest. Second. For motion and a second to approve the consent agenda if there's no questions. Mr. Clerk, will you call roll? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council Member Burnt? Aye. Council Member Palmer? Aye. Council Member Little Roberts? Aye. Council Member Borton? Aye. All ayes. There were no items moved from the consent agenda, so we'll jet right into <laughs> our department reports with our Public Works annual update. And welcome to the stage, Dale Bolthouse. Yeah. Yay. Thank you, Mayor. I don't know if I'm going to need these or not, glasses here. So uh, thank you. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to the opportunity to take uh, uh, the next uh, few minutes of your time and share a little bit about what's going on with the Public Works Department. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, th the things about doing your update in advance of the annual uh, performance evaluations is you get an opportunity to kind of selectively uh, convince some to join you uh, in the audience. And uh, so we're, uh, thank you uh, team for, uh, uh, for sitting back there. Actually, um, I've told them that it, w with the first question I'm bailing out to the subject matter experts. So. They do have a they do have a role here to uh, uh, in today to pay attention and know what's going on. So um, we're going to uh, hopefully take uh, you know maybe the next thirty minutes or so and and talk a little bit about public works and what we've been doing and some of the things that are kind of driving our world. This this first photo I, I just wanted to uh, to point out that uh, we have our uh, water superintendent Dennis Teller teaching one of the classes of third graders as they come through. We love doing that every year, um, and it's no small task. We actually <coughs> teach 64 classes and over 1,600 youngsters on exactly what public works is. So uh, by, by doing that, uh, we, uh, uh, we learn our, uh, ourselves on what to do. We're going to um, walk through this a uh, little differently than what we have, uh, I think, in the past few years. We've always kind of taken a department by department approach and we've marched various members of our staff up here to share what's going on. And we decided this year to kind of turn it around a little bit. And, and so what we're gonna do is kind of walk you through what we think are some of the key guiding operational objectives of our department. And uh, unfortunately, that means you get to listen to me and only me for probably the next 30 minutes or so. so uh, uh, bear with me. Uh, I'll try to walk us through, but we've got we've got a lot of fun things going on, and so this will be kind of the format in which we move through those. Before we dig in, though, what would it be without some kind of fun facts and figures? I know that you guys are running out of material at cocktail parties and other <laughs> important events happening around the city. So. If you, uh, if you take a look here, uh, you know, some of the ways that we measure growth is, uh, you know, in, in orders of magnitude. So we've got, uh, as you can see, some 600 miles plus of water main uh, that we have in our city. We're approaching 38,000 uh, water accounts uh, this year, uh, 3.2 billion gallons of water produced. And I did a little calculation here, and that would be the equivalent of taking and filling and emptying the iconic Meridian Tower 6,400 times a year. So if that uh, helps you get a little scale around that. We're averaging about 9.9 .9 million gallons a day that we, uh, we uh, uh, produce and, and deliver. On the sewer side, you see we're approaching about 500 miles of main. Customer information is something similar. 32 miles added in the last year and a half, so it's, uh, we're adding to that total pretty quickly. There again, um, we grew about 167 million gallons over last year, and to just uh, add some, uh, uh, some uh, perspective, that's about 4,700 Olympic-sized swimming pools that we uh -huh. processed in the, in the last year, so... Um, few fun things associated with growing. In our first category of supporting growth, um, we want to highlight some examples of what's going on for those areas. This is not a complete list and that's uh, in everybody's benefit this afternoon. So um, 
want to talk about a couple of the, of the key projects that are in progress right now or recently commuted, uh, completed. Two of them are very significant that you've been a part of and been able to be out there. One is the Headworks, that project's completed, it's up and running and serving us well. The second is the first phase of our capacity expansion, which largely focuses on the hydraulic um, aspect of, uh, of waste treatment. Um, that's going to be up running in the next 60 days, so we're, we're approaching commissioning uh, in early November and coming online in December. Both of those projects really do a great job of setting kind of a superstructure foundation of that facility and will allow us to incrementally grow on that investment over the next many years as we uh, continue to build out our city. It also plays a very critical role in our permit compliance. Uh, so big, big efforts that are coming to uh, fruition there. Um, we've also got a couple of other projects that uh, are, are included in, in this, and that is the Linder Road sewer trunk line. Um, that completes in April of this coming year and, and kind of finalizes our commitment for the South uh, Meridian Growth and Annexation Area, as well as some pretty significant upgrades to our Black Cat lift stations which allow those to continue to handle the larger capacity. Um, looking ahead a little bit, we've got a couple of projects to highlight here for you. One is the digestion uh, process. So we've been focusing a lot on the hydraulic aspects of the plant, and now it's time to kind of move over and look at our processing solids. So we'll design and construct over the next couple of years, um, another digester for the solid stream side of the plant. Um, and that's going to be approximately a $10 million investment uh, once it's completed. Also, we're starting our initial planning efforts. It's in our master plan. But the McDermott Trunk Sewer Project, which takes a large main line from roughly McMillan all the way down to the uh, Highway 84 is a phased-in project that starts here in uh, 24 with design and then subsequently design and build sections uh, on through uh, the end of the decade uh, where that trunk line will be completed. That project's extremely critical for the city's ability to grow and serve the western side of our uh, boundary as well as the whole southwestern plateau in the city. So a big, big project that is um, um, on the horizon and take, getting quite a bit of an attention already by the team. That's a fantastic picture. It really shows a lot in the depth and complexity just in one picture. Just in the, in the, yeah. in the sewer there. Uh-huh. Yeah, we have a, you know, as we, uh, as we have to extend further and further, we have a number of, of deep sewer services that, yeah. uh, that are critical to our operation. On the water side, uh, obviously a lot of activity there. Typically our growth comes in the areas of supply wells and reservoirs and distribution system. And, and obviously that's no different right now. We have recently completed and brought online three new wells in our growth areas and we have three more wells that are planned in the 10-year CFP window. Also, we're, we have uh, visibility of our next reservoir. That's out about eight years and is uh, currently planned for the Eustick and serving the western side of the city. Um, also on the um, water growth side, we've got uh, the completion of a mainline extension down on Linder in that Victory 10-mile area. And, and what's that, Treg? It's, if I understood, 23,290 feet are being added as part of that product. Thank you for the question. Um, so anyhow, so we Great have... Great question, uh, Trey. We've, <laughs> um, it was. Good job. So we have, we have a, lot of, a lot of activity there. One of the, one of the things that, uh, that has a significant influence, and I wanted to share this with you, this happens to be a, math of, a map of a lot of the projects that we have going around the city, but I, I direct you to the purple sections. Those are the ITD and, I, and ACHD projects that likely will have some influence on our ability to 
um, either adjust or upgrade or improve um, our water and, and sewer mainline systems. And there's a number of them. There's, there's actually 48 projects in the, in the plan where uh, road work will give us those opportunities to, to make those improvements. So partnering with them, understanding what they're doing uh, is very important to, to us on our planning uh, side of the, of the picture here. If you take all of those projects and, and add them up uh, and the others that are in our portfolio, we have roughly $72 million that we're planning to spend uh, as identified in our 10-year CFP that was recently completed. So that's from FY21 to FY30. Uh, and that represents uh, about 40% uh, or so of the total CFP spending is supporting growth in our city. So, um, not insignificant by any, any stretch of the mean uh, of the sense. One of our other uh, primary guiding objectives is certainly meeting regulatory requirements. And that, uh, as you're well aware, we're highly regulated by DEQ, EPA, State of Idaho, and, and just about anybody else that has a license out there and can, uh, uh, can uh, uh, carry, uh, uh, carry the day with us. So, Anyway, uh, we want to take you through some of the major things that are happening on that front. Believe it or not, the, uh, on the wastewater side, we have already completed our second year of the new MPDS permit uh, and are well into our third year. That's a five-year uh, compliance permit, and I am very proud of the wastewater team and their efforts and can, uh, can tell you today that we have no notice of noncompliance against that permit. So an excellent job by that team as we move forward on that effort. Uh, the state continues to transition from the federal controlled to state controlled over the uh, MPDS uh, and uh, discharge permit systems. So it's now referred to as the Idaho uh, IPDS uh, program. And they're also uh, taking over compliance. So we're still looking for, uh, I guess, an elevated oversight into our operations and organization uh, as the state continues to make that transition. These things are, are just constantly evolving. Um, and to that end, we've created within our department a, uh, a permit planning team. It's not too early to get started. Uh, there are some 40 to 45 permits that are outstanding around the state. We're watching those. They've issued a few on a draft basis. There are actually no permits that have been completely um, uh, issued. But, our, but this team is tasked with keeping an eye on those, understanding what the key issues are across the state and the landscape, those that are here in the valley, because we likely will see those in our new permit, which now is less than three years away, we'll have to file our application for our new permit in a uh, little over two years. So a, a very strong effort by the team to make sure that we are aware of what's going on, we're available to comment on them, and make sure that Meridian's interests are well represented in the, in the permitting process. Another uh, important project from a regulatory standpoint that you uh, uh, have approved us to uh, initiate, and that is the side stream phosphorus project. Uh, we have got to get that material out of our process stream, and that's going to be critical for us meeting the final limits on, on phosphorus. Um, A couple other items that are a little bit further out, but but are but are right around the corner. You know, once we once we get our current capacity expansion project up, running and 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 fully commissioned, we turn our sights to uh, the old facility and retrofitting it, and it's largely going to enable us to have the processing capacity. So the loading that's coming with the new hydraulic volume is what we need to focus on next. And that's referred to as that phase two process capacity. Um, and that actually starts in design in 21 and completes in 23. And that's another $18 million initiative. And it's really that 
processing capability, that processing time that will allow us to drive our nutrient um, uh, limits down to the level that they'll need to be. Uh, included right on the heels of that project is the tertiary filtration. So we just can't get where we need to be with biological processes. And the final step will have to be a, a very complex filtration effort <coughs> to remove those final levels of constituents to meet our final permit. Those projects come online uh, and start design in FY22, and we have to have them up and running by the end of FY25 so that we can confirm steady state operation and performance before our 27 <coughs> deadline for those permit requirements. I don't know why we stuck this WERF second access on there, but that's an ongoing kind of thorn in the side. But we're working diligently to still uh, make every effort to secure a second entrance, an emergency access way into the facility as we continue to grow. We've got a primary path, um, and we still believe that that's going to be a, uh, a possibility. So that continues to be worked on as well. On the water side, um, equally proud, no non-compliance concerns in our water system as they um, uh, continue to get both federal and, and, uh, and state regulation over them. So great job by our water department. We successfully uh, navigated our way through the UCMR testing phase one, which was done in May. Um, you're familiar with the... Um, uh, 50 or so constituents that we had to test all of our supply wells and we came out of that in, in, in very good shape. Uh, no health advisories or anything of that nature were, were needed to be um, issued. So great effort on that front. Um, we're also successfully uh, completed design and are implementing a corrosion control study, which is a regulatory requirement to make sure that our water uh, is not of um, a uh, constituent or pH level that might create corrosion occurring not only in our distribution system but in the homes of our and uh, places of work of our constituents. And so that's a year-long study that we're going to have to do. And depending upon the results of that, we may have to do things like uh, further uh, filtration or water conditioning or something like that to eliminate any corrosivity that's in it. So uh, stay tuned. We'll keep you posted on that. We're not anticipating any significant issue, but uh, a 12-month test is actually what will determine uh, what next steps, if any, we have to take regarding corrosion control. If you take the regulatory compliance areas that we talked about, add them all up, you can see that that is also coincidentally uh, a little over $70 million in the 10-year CFP, closer to 42% of the um, projected spending on uh, those items that help us meet our regulatory requirements. The next key area um, we wanted to share a few things with you on is improving uh, quality and, and, and our customer service. Uh, you've got some interesting photos there from some water treatment. That's where um, those efforts really fall in, in, in our opinion. Um, although, although we are blessed with um, good water supply, um, no water or not all water is created equal. And we do have a number of issues um, in our water supply that we have to concern ourselves with. And all of them are largely naturally occurring We've, we've talked to death, I think, the manganese and the iron. We also have things like arsenic. We have uranium. We have hydrogen sulfide. Uh, a number of those items can create uh, both regulatory and aesthetic kind of challenges for us. Um, adds a lot of complexity to what we're doing. And uh, the water and engineering team uh, here in the last six months or so are really taking a deep dive down into water quality 
um, issues associated with each zone in our system and in developing long-term strategies that will allow us to ensure uh, a, a redundant, high-quality supply of water that our customers demand. Uh, in support of that, we have four um, water treatment facilities, largely for iron and manganese, that are on now, online now. We have one more coming on, which is Well 28, which is below Black Rock, which will uh, help that area. And we actually have seven more water quality treatment facilities in our 10-year uh, CFP. So um, a lot of effort to make sure that we can supply uh, quality water to our customers. Um, facilitating that is the ongoing flushing program, which is uh, largely becoming directional, um, unidirectional in nature, and we can go out and hit targeted areas. Um, we've seen um, a pretty significant reduction in the uh, occurrences of complaints associated with discolored water or sediment and a lot of this effort has been I think uh, you know is paying dividends. Um, AMI which is the automatic meter um, infrastructure project that we're getting uh, and gaining uh, quite a bit of experience with our census meter efforts um, is, is likely to be a substantial tool for us uh, down the road here from a diagnostic standpoint, from a consumption standpoint, from a customer service standpoint, that'll, that'll enable us to have uh, near continuous monitoring of water consumption by customer. Um, this year we'll have about 40% of our customers that have that capability and over the next several years we'll transition that to 100%. We have to make change out, it's quite expensive to do so. Uh, but it will be it will be an important opportunity for us. On the wastewater side, uh, we uh, we decided to focus on one item, and that is um, odor control. As part of the uh, Headworks project, we installed um, a state-of-the-art biofilter. That's the photo that you see on the screen here, and uh, that allows us to. Uh, um, generate a, 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 a biological process that consumes the uh, constituents that contribute to odor. This takes all of the air off of the uh, uh, highest uh, uh, odor contributing areas of the facility, which is that head works, and it, and it brings it through here. So that system is coming online, and uh, we anticipate it'll go a long ways to, to helping uh, reduce odors uh, for our neighbors that surround the facility and uh, um, to help um, identify and, and confirm that we've planned a comprehensive odor study to be completed next summer and we'll be able to compare that back to the one that was done in 2004 and we anticipate we've taken some great strides in reducing that issue and, and we'll continue to do so every chance we get. Um, one of the areas that uh, we, we also believe contribute to improve, improving quality and, and, and customer service is our streetlight program. You know, this thing has just really blown up um, over the last uh, few years, and, and we have a full-on program now that we're managing. Uh, you'll see that we're over 7,500 lights that we're responsible for as a city. Actually, almost 20% of those have been converted to LED, which is, which is uh, uh, certainly heading the right direction. All new lights going in um, are of a higher efficiency, and as we replace and touch and change them out, we're doing the same with theirs. So a big, big effort for the community in uh, re, you know, improving illumination for those walking to school routes, high crime areas, and any, any other vehicle pedestrian safety type efforts. We're adding over 500 lights a year to this program. And one of the key things that uh, we had to institute in the last year was uh, we have to go out as part of the 811 dig line uh, type system and we have to mark the power runs to every one of those street lights. And we successfully navigated. Uh, we have a fix in place. Uh, we have a team that's identified a variety of options and uh, you'll likely see us come forward with a request to 
uh, allow us to minimize the cost and improve the service of our location of streetlights. Um, contributing as well, um, we've leveraged, I think, uh, very well the CDBG grant uh, opportunities, and that's helping to um, improve those underserved areas in our city from a street lighting perspective. If you take those particular projects for quality and customer service, you'll see that that portfolio is a, just a little under $5 million uh, in the 10-year CFP. On the uh, improving or increasing system reliability, you know, our customers expect us to be performing at peak 24-7, 365, hitting on all cylinders. And, and reliability and the things that we do uh, to improve reliability are really at the core uh, of what we do every day. Some of the initiatives that we wanted to highlight um, to you today is uh, that uh, we, uh, we commissioned a long-term investment uh, replacement program for our uh, um, buried infrastructure and this group um, has completed their phase one and we're going to be sharing that study with you in November. But we charged them with really figuring out just exactly what we have in the ground. Profile that system. What's there? How much is it? What's the age? What's the condition? What do we need to do about it as we look longer term for, as you could see, over 1,100 miles of combined water and sewer infrastructure that someday is going to be need to be dealt with. One of the snippets out of that report is the chart you see in front of you, and that's the age of the pipe in years, and that's both water and sewer. And so you can see one of the things that we do have in our favor is that we're not a 150-year-old system. Uh, most of our pipe has been installed, as you can see, uh, in the last 30 years. And with today's knowledge of pipe life, we have some time to understand and, and prepare and deal with this issue. And we also have various options on ways to do that. And I look forward to that team bringing forward to you uh, the study in its, in its entirety, as well as discussions around some of our uh, options to deal with it. SCADA is another area that is just incredibly important for us um, as an operational unit. Uh, we've invested heavily. I think we, sh we were at somewhere over $6 million over the past 15 to 20 years. But uh, we cannot manage our operations uh, without having that kind of a system. And we've made substantial um, improvements in the reliability of it, the trust in it. We're developing standards. We're master planning. So we really have a good grip on this incredibly important program. You cannot measure a billion dollars worth of assets without having some pretty good information available to you. And that's exactly what our SCADA system and our SCADA uh, team has offered uh, for us. A couple other things on, on system reliability is that we do have planned in our, in our capital planning um, you know, opportunistic replacements of pipe, uh, those that are undersized, those that are of an inferior material, those that are the oldest in the system, those that might have a concern. So we do have those. This map shows our city projects that we have planned in the CFP uh, to try to address some of those. Additionally, you know, we're doing a good job. We, we don't have a lot of problems, but the way to prevent those from occurring is our engineering team has developed and updated design standards by which we hold all development and all contractors to to make sure that we have the best chance of getting maximum asset life cycle um, out of um, the installations that are going into the ground today. A couple of other uh, final efforts to just review in this area. These are kind of the back of the house type items. So they're uh, there are things like inventory analysis. Uh, it, it's, it's the right part at the right place at the right time at the right price. 
And, and that is no easy feat, particularly when we're doubling the size of some of the infrastructure we have. So, so inventory is becoming increasingly uh, critical. Um, and we've got a group that's done a great job of uh, evaluating our inventory system and making sure that we, uh, uh, it's performing and, and supporting our organization as needed. Warranty tracking, nearly everything that we buy goes in, you know, does have some kind of warranty to it. Any contributed capital that comes from developers has a two-year warranty on it. We need to make sure that we understand we're tracking that, we know when those things are coming off warranty, we understand their condition assessment, and, and we're leveraging warranty and not, uh, not uh, having the, uh, uh, the liability of, uh, of, of complete uh, cost burden to the city. Asset management planning um, will be uh, and, and uh, will, will continue to, to, to be a critical part of our program of, of managing our assets, uh, understanding their life cycle, their cost, uh, those kinds of things. And so that in conjunction with our GIS, what's on here is a heat map. And that happens to be the heat map that was uh, created with with our GAS system for the um, trash or treasure program that would uh, occurred earlier this summer. So very important functions here. One of the other areas that, I, that I, I'm compelled to mention is that, you know, our staff, uh, part of our staff is responsible for facilities, uh, those facilities for the, uh, for the city. And, and you can see now we have 14 facilities approaching 300,000 square feet. Um, and there's an awful lot of work that that team does to do, uh, make sure that uh, our facilities are um, operating efficiently, uh, they look professional, and uh, we acknowledge them as doing a great job. Additionally, that group also supports project management for things like Station 6, which I hope you got a chance to get out there a week or so ago. It's coming along great, and uh, that's going to be a wonderful um, asset for the fire department. Those items combined um, are uh, 64 items in the CFP and uh, are almost $25 million in the 10-year plan for increasing reliability. Ensuring financial health is certainly important to, to all of us, um, and that's no different for uh, public works. The Enterprise Fund is uh, is uh, is where we live, and uh, before we before we take a, a a closer look, I wanted to give you now kind of a summary view of the CFP. So take all those little pieces of the pie and some of those areas we just talked about. Our CFP uh, for Public Works and Enterprise Fund is 176 million dollars. There's 197 initiatives over that 10-year plan. Uh, includes capital, operational. Uh, things and uh, those are incremental to our uh, annual operating budget, which this year for FY20 is uh, is 19 million dollars that we uh, presented and that you approved. So I wanted to, to kind of give you so so how do we pay for it and what does that all look like? So um, we continually update um, our uh, rate fund model. This is a copy that um, was just recently created based on our CFP projections, the city's growth projections from the growth summit, uh, inflation factors, all those kinds are in there. And you'll see that uh, we feel very good that we have a healthy fund balance. We are in a save cycle uh, right now. And uh, that's, hap that's in addition to significant growth which is contributing additional money to the overall fund balance. So, so we feel good about being able to fund the projections in the 10-year model. But as you can see, it's not sustainable um, forever. And this is something that uh, we, uh, we need to put some effort against uh, this year and uh, uh, bring you some recommendations on what we think might be some reasonable adjustments to start to look at what this thing looks out, uh, you know, eight or nine, ten years from now, and uh, what small incremental things can mean today to help uh, avoid, you know, larger issues later. 
some of those items that uh, we are have on our plan of attack for this year is um, we are concluding our efforts on the assessment assessment fee and the uh, system development charge. Uh, this thing still uh, it looms, is, which is a play on word in the uh, in the legal system. But but some determinations have been made, and there's a there's a model and a formatting and a, and a calculation called the Loomis model, and uh, we've completed an assess. I guess a comparison of our assessment fees against that model, and we align very, very carefully or very closely to that. Um, and uh, so we feel good that the assessment fees and things that we're charging are um, uh, defensible today. Um, we're uh, uh, completing that work, and we'll bring back a little bit more detail, detail to you here in the next uh, uh, 30 or 45 days. We have also have in our plan to complete a cost of service um, analysis that has not been done for a number of years in public works. And, and that really is to make sure that we understand our costs, we understand um, where they fall in terms of rates versus base fees versus assessment fees. Uh, are they fixed? Are they variable? Are they direct? Are they indirect? It really is very similar to some of the efforts that the, the city has embarked on, and, and that helps, uh, this will help us align and make sure that we have true costs and fees occurring in the areas that they should. And likely, uh, if there are any adjustments, we would like to see those made uh, in the 20 FY21 rate fee schedule. So um, we'll uh, keep you abreast of that activity as we go through the year. Um, we continue to expect ourselves to look hard at um, what we do, how we do it, uh, make sure that we are both effective and efficient. Uh, to that end, we look inward uh, as often as we look outward and, and try to find those areas of opportunity. So um, we do have a number of optimization efforts, and, and assisting in, in, in that is um, we have embarked uh, on the path down peak. Um, we have our first innovation team, which is part of our laboratory uh, group. Uh, we have plans for teams to roll out quarterly, and we'll continue to, uh, to dive deep into our, our own processes and procedures and see if we can drive out waste and cost opportunistically. Um, we've also done a lot of work this year on our KPIs, and we've kind of built those off the level of service platform that includes, you know, quality, reliability, customer service, regulatory requirements, and, and things like sustainable op operations, uh, inventory management. Uh, we've done an analysis on a number of things like our MXU, simple, uh, simple modifications to some things that have been overlooked that are going to save the you know, the city some money. Um, this happens to be a snapshot of one of our um, uh, KPIs as it relates to water quality calls. And uh, we were preparing and thinking about doing a deeper dive on these, but the mayor has um, uh, prepared us to come back in the next uh, 45 days or so, and you'll get the opportunity for Public Works to present to you our 20 KPIs that we're managing for operational purposes, and uh, we'll invite you to, to look at and comment about those uh, and, and help us develop you know, you know, more forward-facing um, uh, measures of performance for us. Um, we'll quickly jump through. You, you're well aware that this last year, I think, was kind of a watershed year as it relates to environmental efforts. Um, really a foundational year uh, for us. We've uh, spent uh, a, 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 you know, a lot of time and, and, and resources in, in developing the environmental program and kind of the main components of that that you've been uh, uh, made aware. So it's been a, it's been a great year um, on that front and, and we have a lot of exciting things going going on, and you, you heard about those recently, so I'm not going to go through those in a lot of detail. 
the other category on the environmental front that uh, you're very familiar with that we're, uh, we feel good in that is the whole um, um, area of solid waste, um, hiring solid waste coordinator. Um, we just got and we'll be sharing with you next week the results of our first uh, environmental solid waste and recycling survey. A uh, couple of little snippets of that I think uh, uh, are in these um, um, charts, but uh, uh, one takeaway is that uh, you'll see that uh, people are excited about having the government be a leader in this area uh, and help drive um, uh, you know, environmental activities. And the other is kind of a confirmation of what's important to customers. We talk about them as triple bottom line. They're identified here as, as affordability, reliability, and public health. And so you'll see that that matches well with the way that we recommend we look at initiatives in this front. So finally, uh, uh, certainly not last, I guess we, we would like to think it's first among equals is that um, we, we find it uh, an important uh, part of our objectives is to be investing in the workforce. Um, and we, uh, we need to have a good workforce to carry out the day-to-day -day expectations and be able to carry us into the future uh, for the variety of challenges that exist. Um, I love all, uh, all of these pictures. There's just some snippets of some different work teams you can see. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're, we're proud of, of each of those work groups. You know, one of our biggest challenges this year was really um, uh, uh, keeping people in positions, uh, not, uh, uh, you know, uh, vacancy rates. You'll see we had 18 new hires into our organization the past year. Um, we continue to fight the unemployment levels, which are low. Uh, we're competing against a lot of entities for, for new hires, and so this churn that's been occurring in some of our, some parts of our organization has been problematic. It obviously places pressure on the balance of employees to keep the ball rolling and get the work done, um, and uh, we're very cognizant of this and, and, and are spending, um, you know, a lot of effort to try to uh, uh, get our um, fill rate on positions up um, where it should be. Uh, this photograph was just taken uh, at the um, recent uh, Public Works picnic and, and represents those new staff members and um, we, sure, uh, we sure appreciate what they bring to our team. In addition to uh, some of the employment challenges that, uh, that we face, um, we do have a, a number of evolving needs, and uh, um, those include operational complexity, you know, as we talk about the, the projects and the landscape and the regulations and things, it's, uh, it's adding a lot of uh, technical uh, and operational complexity, uh, incre increasing requirements for licensure and certifications, uh, I, I found it interesting that we, uh, you know, it, it, it feels like it should be easier, but uh, 167 licensures uh, we have uh, that are uh, mostly required to run the kinds of operations that we're charged with. So uh, pretty significant effort on that front. And uh, as we grow, we continue to face things like wastewater 24/7 coverage and with that brings a lot of its uh, a lot of its own challenges but uh, but we're doing well in trying to uh, uh, keep our arms around those items we have some strategies that we think are um, playing into uh, and will continue to play a role um, I see that we're there it is so you know as we grow we're always looking at organization we're forced and faced to be looking at job classification, making sure our jobs are matching with the requirements, uh, the skills, the abilities that are that are there. Um, one of the interesting things that that uh, I, I want to plant a seed with uh, 
with you today is, is really job family structure changes. And, and these, uh, this one diagram is meant to kind of share how we're configured today and, and one idea of how we may want to be looking at our organization in the future. So if you look at a lot of our job class areas, we have an operator one, an operator two, operator three, operator four, and those individuals are, are somewhat uh, you know, trained in that, uh, that particular skill. Many of them have limited ability to move up, to grow, um, and in fact, it's very limiting in terms of the flexibility when we look across the landscape of the work we have to, ha have to get done. And I would challenge you that the new strategy below is a much better model in some of our areas of our organization where we need uh, maximum skill and maximum flexibility to deploy people against the challenges of the day. Um, and with that comes increased effectiveness and increased efficiency. This is very similar to what we've implemented in our uh, collections team. We have, we have six individuals, and instead of having two ones and two twos and two threes, we need six individuals that have got the full breadth of skills that we can deploy um, uh, to where we need them effectively and efficiently instead of having circumstances like we've had where if employee A is not available, the equipment sits idle because nobody else is qualified or trained to step in and operate it. So uh, just, a, just something that we're gonna be spending a lot of time on because we have a pretty archaic process in a number of our um, operations where they are structured laterally instead of vertically like this. An another area we think holds great opportunity uh, that maybe offers us a pipeline for permanent employment, and that is we've got to get in and, and better understand the opportunities associated with internship programs. And I know that's something that the city's looking at in a little more detail. So in spite of the challenges, uh, we keep driving ahead. We're proud of our team. Uh, we believe they're capable of carrying the burden, not only today, but whatever the future holds. Uh, we continue to invest in them, and a lot of them are investing in themselves as well. So a couple that I just want to mention to you, um, you know, Dave Miles achieved his MBA from NNU, utilizing the uh, program uh, made available through HR for tuition reimbursement. Uh, Christina Keith was um, successful in, in passing her professional engineering exam. Dave Gassel and Rick Murray joined the very elite group. They're supervisors in wastewater. They now hold the level four wastewater treatment licensure. So a very exclusive group in the state. We had eight internal promotions. I'm telling you, this is the team to get the job done. And those are just a couple of examples of that. And I want to finish by just sharing with you some of the um, acknowledgments and recognition uh, of some various groups of people. At our Public Works Award uh, picnic every year, we uh, have Public Works Awards. Uh, these are uh, typically submitted by their peers in various categories, and we just wanted to give them due acknowledgement for the excellent work that they've done. So our Employees of the Year uh, in Public Works was Dan Berthy from Engineering and Darcy Cummings in Water. Our Supervisor of the Year was Travis Kassire, uh, our Wastewater Superintendent. Uh, Dave Gassel was voted the SWIAS Operator of the Year in the Southwest section of Idaho. Uh, proud of Dave and, and uh, as part of our uh, care value efforts uh, uh, round one, uh, Don Case was our uh, city care champion this last spring. We also have some team awards, and uh, these are deserving efforts. And the uh, team of the year this year was the SCADA team. So this, this historically was, a, was kind of a one-person show. You've supported organizing a group around it, uh, adding the skills and ability to this group and they have just done a phenomenal job for us. They have advanced the trust and the reliability in our SCADA system. 
uh, which is critical for operation, and we're really proud of, of uh, Marshall, Aaron, and Dennis, and the work that they've, they've done on, our, uh, on the SCADA front. Um, another project of the year um, that we acknowledge was the Well 22 water treatment, and, and hopefully you got a chance to get out there when we had our open house. Uh, but this is a phenomenal facility. We took a well, it was at Bear Creek, whose water quality was so poor that that, uh, that well was not being utilized at all. It was basically a fire flow backup. Use it only if you need to. And uh, we, uh, um, um, the team put, uh, put together a plan and, and built a treatment facility, and now it's a, it's a phenomenal well, a lead well in that zone, and uh, this team executed that project exceptionally well. You can see the names down the list. It's a great mix of, of, uh, uh, of people from various parts of our organization, but uh, um, a, a great acknowledgement for that project. Wasn't there a contest associated with that event? You mean water quality or cookie, no, like or cookie, cookie quality? A cookie quality contest. Who yeah, won? there was. I, I, I think that was a, a draw. Uh, there were two no, 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 very no, no, unique no. designs of cookies that uh, yeah. no, I, uh, I conceded uh, Mr. Teller and the um, hydro water drop <laughs> design carried the day as opposed to the it the iconic Meridian Water Tower, which I thought, uh, you know, had the nostalgia. So there was there was kind of an age breakdown. On, yeah, but uh, it had nothing to do with the, the um, shape of the cookie. It was the taste, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, right. <laughs> so I didn't, yeah, I didn't see a lot of them being eaten as they were uh, uh, finding their way out of there. But that was a lot of fun. So great project. We have a cross-functional team, so this is one, this is a project that kind of mixes up group, uh, requires, uh, you know, more than just your area, and uh, this year uh, being acknowledged for the effort was a long-term infrastructure project. So this is a, a project that Warren and Lorelei led and, and really involved everybody across the organization, and I will tell you it is one of the most impressive internally developed reports that I've ever seen, and I'm excited for you to get exposure to that. So very deserving for those efforts, and that, uh, um, that work will, uh, will facilitate a lot of improvements uh, for, for many years to come. Uh, a new award this year was for innovation. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a recognition committee, and that team uh, felt like there was uh, there was room for some innovative uh, awards this year. We had a number of nominees and things, but uh, uh, the the recipient recipient of this year's innovation innovation award was the Streetlight Utility Location Team, and that that not that that really started with the uh, the uh, recognition that oh my gosh this is something that we needed to be doing, um, and we scrambled and got on top of it, uh, got compliant. Uh, and they've, uh, they've done a lot of great work in identifying uh, solutions and alternatives. And, and as I mentioned, you'll, uh, you'll see, uh, you'll see uh, I, I think, uh, very soon here uh, a presentation on an alternative we'd like to pursue. Uh, but it was really characterization of that whole streetlight program, including location, that, uh, uh, that uh, was very good work. So the, although we are scattered over three locations uh, across the city, we truly function as one team and uh, a team that, uh, that I and, and our management staff are very proud to, uh, to work with. So um, before I, uh, I conclude, um, I want to say thank you to Susie um, and Emma and Cindy for their work. This isn't stuff that I can do, I guarantee. I can barely push the button here, but, uh, but they do magic. Uh, they pull together the information, and we really appreciate their, uh, their support in putting together today's presentation, so I wanted to acknowledge them. And with that, I would stand for any kind of questions you might have. Thank you, Dell. Questions from Council, Mr. Burt. 
No questions, Del. Fantastic presentation. Very thorough. I knew for a fact you didn't do that on your own, but right off the get go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It was, it was that impressive. Hey, have you ever seen me curl? <laughs> no, yeah, but okay. you can yeah. see us on Instagram. <laughs> um, I uh, just great job. Um, you've, you've, you've put you've put the city in a very healthy, uh, safe position. I, I don't think that people realize the complexity of what your department does. It is vast. It's huge. I still can't wrap my arms around it. It's it's complex. And that makes two of us. <laughs> and you guys did a great job. Um, you, 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 you've come up with a great plan, um, not only you know, that 5, 10, 15, 20 year plan, and your team has executed it. And you guys have just done a great job, and I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Ms. Flo Roberts. Madam Mayor, Dale and team, thank you. I have the privilege of being the liaison, and it never ceases to amaze me what you all accomplish, and so, Great leader of a great team that does amazing, amazing things for this city. And I love the comment that we got regarding being the first line of us being healthy is a healthy system, and and you guys make that happen. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Any questions? Madam Mayor. Mr. Borton. Well, I'll ask a sideways question. Um, kind of go along with, with what is obviously well-deserved mm. praise. Um, we hear all the time um, these types of positive results. One of the, some of the questions that popped up um, in this presentation, um, one which was particularly sideways, it was early on when we talked about the design plan for phase two. And then I thought of it with uh, the change order that was part of the consent today. And it, it revolves generally around the design process when, let me back up, not a very well-formed question. Um, there, there are components in the change order that, that we approved that were elements that weren't designed or weren't part of the original design, so they're added and there's great reason for it, it makes sense, but um, are those types of issues things that, that generally we might not anticipate something in the design and only capture it later on? Or is it something that perhaps the a design professional might be missing? I'm talking just sort of general process as we go into that next phase. Yeah. Sure, Madam Mayor, uh, um, Councilman Borden. I, I, think it's, I think it's a combination. Our, our engineering staff, our operations team, in conjunction with our design engineers, try to anticipate as many of those things that they can and um, if feel necessary, you know, <coughs> would, would, would include the funding to deal with those as part of the project. Invariably though, history did not keep good records on a lot of things, buried infrastructure and stuff that always seems to create a challenge. We found nothing in history that would tell us that when they took care of an underground storage tank gas station over here on the corner that they rolled that material out and dumped it on the site that's now our wastewater treatment plant. So those things do have a tendency to happen, um, unforeseen, but uh, you know our, our group does the best that they can to try to anticipate those items uh, you know, in the design process, but there are always surprises. You know, it, it, uh, it, it's one of the reasons why when you, when you start the process, you've got this wide unknown, uh, you know, category. And then as you move from concept to truly designed and engineered and drawings and then contract, uh, you know, you bid it out, that, those variabilities keep getting narrower and narrower and we should get better and better as that process evolves. But uh, yeah, there, there's always an attempt to try to identify and flush out as many of those things as possible, uh, but we continue to demonstrate that there's some that you just can't, uh, you just can't anticipate. I don't know, does that answer your yeah, question? It, Madam Mayor, it, it does, and I know there's, yeah. the flip side of it is there probably anything that's missed by 
the design consultant that is on them, they end up probably covering the cost, perhaps, of, of any miss, and we don't see it, perhaps. Um, perhaps, but in many cases, if it's, if it's a fault of something that they did, yeah, if yeah. it's just purely an unknown thing, uh, that they wouldn't be obligated. And it looked like this one was a good example where there's some standard evolution of the project that necessitates those change orders. So um, I was just curious how that's handled generally. Um, the other question was maybe just a kind of a quick update on what we addressed a year ago, the area of drilling concern and, and, and when you talked about water quality, if there's any snapshot update in that process and have things mm -hmm. been as improved as we expected? Well, it, uh, you know, so the result of that effort was we did not receive an area of drilling concern designation. However, we did get a commitment from IDWR that they would uh, uphold and institute the principles of of uh, you know well construction and things that would protect protect those aquifers, and and I will tell you that that Kyle and, and his group keep an eye on every single well that's drilled in that area. We have had some challenges that we've had to fight to ensure that you know those rules and and, and regulations do get upheld to protect it. So um, I don't know if. Kyle has any other comments? I think, I think you covered the, the bases there. For yeah. In okay. general, uh, we're, we're better than they have been doing. They're not perfect, but they know that because we're telling them. Yeah. Kyle, you can't talk from the back so, of the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's just us amongst friends. Yeah. No, so, so, that, so, so what Kyle is suggesting is what I, what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. You've been here long enough. <laughs> Madam Mayor, I apologize for trying to <laughs> get from the peanut gallery. But uh, I, yeah, Dale, in general, Dale covered that pretty well. Um, we, uh, we basically checked up on IDWR about a year ago and found uh, some shortcomings and let them know. And they promised to do better. And we're checking up on them again, actually, right now. And we think they are doing better. So we've made some, we've made a difference. Good. Guarantee that. Thank you for that. You know what, what um, impresses me, Dale, is that is one example of the diligence that our teams um, do in making sure that we're aware of what's going on um, in our area of impact and around us to understand the things that are going on or around us that will could potentially affect us. Um, it always strikes me what you and your team um, do proactively to preempt um, certain impacts that are unanticipated. So, and and that's a great example, Kyle. Thank you for sharing that. And, and I would just add um, to what Councilman Burnt said. This new format is, is phenomenal. It, and I think it's a, a great um, thing to have on our videos that people can go in and see what are we doing in growth? What are we doing in regulatory? And you saw on that pie chart the cost of regulatory. Um, some of it is due to our permit, some of it is not. Um, and maybe that is a recommendation next year to even be able to, to show that delineator um, in that regulatory world. I love the dashboard. I am excited to, when they bring it back, to talk about KPIs and, and why you share what you share. Um, that's very comprehensive and, and it's, it's exciting to see, but it always comes back to your team. And say more. I'm very proud of this team and 
and uh, me too. And and I love that they're proud of what they do in the city. And it, it's hard, been hard for me not to be nostalgic um, as I sit here and think, these, oh my gosh, how far you've come over this over this whole period. I mean, you start out with this colored water. Oh my God. <laughs> no, I actually had people walking into the old city hall with jars of water. And um, I remember we were handing out those little um, pill things that, um, oh, we, we could go on. But just how far this whole department has come, our facilities have come, our ability to, even the chart was exciting to see the different age of our, our pipes, our, our main lines, and that sort of thing. I mean, it's just like, that's so cool, we finally can show that. Yeah. So thank you to um, all of you that, have, that are sitting with us. Um, I, I hope you go back and you share um, your elected <coughs> pride of what you do and how you do it and the dedication that you give to the city day in and day out. Really appreciate that. The MP, you're okay. the MP. Okay. Thank you, Dell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks. Okay, item 5B is under our Parks and Recreation Department. And this is exciting. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm here to um, talk to you about the third addendum to an agreement for the development and joint use of Heroes Park. Uh, but bef before I do, um, I'd like to just acknowledge Powell and the effort they do uh, really for the community and the programs that they run um, with soccer, baseball, flag football for the youth is just really, really tremendous. And we're, we're proud that they use our parks as, as much as they do. Um, the other thing that I would like to bring up is that in March 2011, they agreed to pay the city $300,000 over a 15-year period for the development of, to participate in the development of Heroes Park. So they, had a, they were on a 15-year payment plan and on October 4th, they made their final payment to the city, six years ahead of schedule. So really a tremendous accomplishment. And just the way that the organization is run and um, their commitment to the city is really tremendous. Um, so I guess with that said, um, we have a new agreement um, that, we, that we're bringing forward. And there's really two basic parts to that. There is um, the design of a parking lot remodel that was discussed during the budget process. Uh, the 10 mile road widening is going to remove a lot of the, the gravel parking lot. Um, so that parking we feel needs to come into the park. Um, in order for the park to be um, sustainable and not be limited in its use going forward over the years, we need more parking. Um, so um, you funded the design of that parking um, for this year in this fiscal year. Pal is agreeing to pay us back for half of the cost of the design, which is $25,500. In addition to that, if we move forward with construction, Powell would like to um, pay us back over time for the cost of the parking, similar to what they did for the cost of the other improvements in the park. So they, in this agreement, are, are committing to um, uh, not to exceed $400,000 to pay the city back over time. Um, they've demonstrated that they can, and then they are willing to do that. Um, so. This would add about 160 parking spots to the park, um, would adequately make up for the loss of parking due to 10 mile road widening. And um, so with that, I will 
stand for questions and ask for your approval of this um, third addendum to the agreement. Thank you, Mike. Council, any questions? Madam Mayor. Mr. Board. Not a question, just a comment. One of my law partners had done work for PAL to try and help with this. I've not talked with anyone with the city with it or my office, but nonetheless, he had helped, so I'm going to abstain from voting on it. Okay. Any questions? Not this is an action item. Do I have a motion? Madam Mayor. Ms. Lowell Roberts. I move that we approve item 5B and proceed. Is that with the agreement? Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve 5B. Um, any discussion? Mr. Clerk, will you call roll? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Burnt? Aye. Councilmember Palmer? Aye. Councilmember Little Roberts? Aye. Councilmember Borton? Abstain. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Okay, item six is an executive session. Do I have a motion? Madam Mayor. Mr. Borton. We're going to executive session pursuant to Idaho State Code 7420201F. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn into executive session. Mr. Clerk, will you call roll? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Burnt? Aye. Councilmember Palmer? Aye. Councilmember Little Roberts? Aye. Councilmember Borton? Aye.